Yeah, so I'll get started with today's session. Uh, so today, <coughs> the last week was about neural networks. Uh, so um, yeah, if I am not mistaken, it was almost entirely about neural networks. So I will also go through some questions uh, as before and um, towards the end after I finish those questions, these questions will be easy only. So it won't take much time to solve them. But once I once I'm over those questions, uh, you can uh, you can ask me uh, questions about uh, if you had any difficulty in any particular topic of the of the week that was taught taught in the week. Okay, so the first uh, so gradient descent. So gradient descent is uh, you must have seen that gradient descent is the algorithm with which we train neural networks. <coughs> Uh, so the question is: uh, So if the step size of uh, so if the step size of gradient descent is too large, then what can happen? Uh, so the first option is overfitting. The second option is model will not converge. Uh, the model will not converge, and we can reach maxima instead of minima, and none of the above. So which one is correct? I mean, can some of you guess? Any one of you? Uh, yeah, somebody says option B. Yeah, so option B would be correct. Uh, that. Uh, so what happens is if the gradient descent is uh, too large, for example, uh, for example, if you have a very well defined, um, well defined function, so it can you can start from here, and if your gradient descent is uh, if you have a very large step size, then you will be asked by gradient descent to move in this direction. But if you have a very high step size, then what will happen is you might go end up here. Uh, then from here, you might uh, so you might end up here. Then uh, so you will so this is a very good function. So in this case, you would uh, you would zigzag. You will continue zigzagging. And you will never converge. I mean, you will never converge to the minima. So even if this is the minima and you are here, let's say, even then you will go. You will do like this. Okay, this zigzagging uh, behavior will take place if your uh, learning rate is very high. So in that case, your model will not converge. Okay, so here is uh, this is actually a function, uh, and I mean x1, x2. This is a classifier. I mean, I have to design a classifier. So the question is. Out of these, uh, out of these transformations that you make, uh, which one would become linearly separable? Uh, so, yeah, somebody shared a jam jam file. Okay, if you have any questions, you can ask me, uh, and uh, yeah, so I'll try to solve them. Uh, right, so. Uh, th these are the different transformations that you are seeing. So x1. So let's first. I have done this. I think last time also I did something of this sort. So x1, x2. Okay. Uh, these are minus one and plus one. So I will write like this. This is x1. This is y. This is x2. And if you have both of uh, if x1 is minus 1 and this is minus 1 then you have class of minus 1 uh, and also if you have both of them as 1 then you have class of minus 1 and the other two cases you have the other classes so of course this is not linearly separable so what transformations uh, do you want to I mean uh, which of these transformations will help you do this will will help this function become linearly uh, separable. Uh, so for that, uh, the I mean, uh, the idea is you need to go about doing all these four different transformations. So I'll show one. I I'll show two maybe, and the other two you can work out. So the first one, let's say. So the first one would be x1 hat and x2 hat, and the corresponding y. So x1 hat would be all of them would be one. X2 hat all of them also would be one. And these as classes of minus one, 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 minus one. So if you see here, all the four points have basically uh, they have all come down to the same point of one and one and one, and therefore of course this is not linearly separable. Okay, so let me do uh, this is a. Let me do b also. 
so now you have x1 hat you have x2 hat and you have y so x1 becomes 1 plus x1 so this is becomes this becomes 0 this becomes 2 this becomes 0 and this also becomes 2 and x2 hat becomes 1 minus x2 so 1 minus of minus 1 if this becomes 2 1 minus of minus 1 becomes 2 this becomes 0 0 so these are your four points so if you plot these four points now so all of them are in the positive axis so 2 all of them are in the positive quadrant now so so this is your one function which is 0 2 and the other is 2 0 and uh, the uh, this one is 2 comma 2 so 2 comma 2 and this is 0 comma 0 so again you see the same it is just so basically this is just a transformation of axis that has happened and because of that this also won't be linearly separable so b is also not linearly separable so now let's look at c for c you have x1 hat x2 hat and y x1 hat is x1 x2 so x1 hat is x1 x2 right okay so this would be 1 uh, this would be minus one, minus 1 minus 1 1 and x2 hat is minus of x1 x2 so this is precisely the negative of this and this is minus 1 1 1 minus 1 so if you draw this now this becomes the first one is 1 and minus 1 1 and minus 1 is this point and okay so both of these points are now same and both of these points are now same which is minus 1 and 1 which is here so now you see that they have become linearly separable so this line for example will separate similarly you will see the last one also will be uh, able to linearly separate uh, i mean the, the, that transformation will also make the system linearly separable you can work it out on your own is the same way as i have done here so I hope that was clear. Okay, so the next question is which of the following functions can be used on the last layer of a artificial neural network? So it's basically a neural network. So for classification, so the options are softmax, sigmoid, tanh, and linear. Can one of you say, uh, for example, can I use a linear a linear uh, activation function on the last layer of a neural network for classification? Okay, one of you is saying yes, the other one is saying no. So, can you come up with your, can you say your own uh, logic as to why? Okay, let us hear the person who first said yes. So, why do you think linear layers can work even uh, for classification when we are doing, uh, I mean as, as a, as a as activation function of the neural network? the decision boundary can be linear okay right so let's say i have a neural network like this okay i have uh, all these connections are there right all these connections i am not drawing them all these connections are there so and this is your final classification i mean with this neuron with this value of the neuron you would do a classification so let's say these are your inputs and these are some weights that you have learned and here the output i mean before the activation the output is so before the activation let's say let's say I denote it by z so before the activation the output is something like w transpose x plus b right i have done this this is exactly similar to logistic regression i mean uh, i would i would think that all of you would understand that this is nothing but logistic regression 
with some weights and something ok something happens in bit in the neural network which is different from logistic regression that is fine. But in the last neuron it, it behaves like a logistic regression model suppose you have this as the input of this neuron what did you do after this in logistic regression. Yes, so you applied something like this right. Now, why you did this? The sigmoid function you remember it will always have a level of minus 0 to uh, sorry it, it will always lie between 0 and 1 right. However, x might increase sigma x will always lie between 0 and 1 and why you wanted to do this was to convert this to a probability distribution. So, for classification you would always want your uh, you would always want your uh, outputs to match to be sort of a probability. So, so that you can say something like this is class 0 with a probability of 60 percent. Of course, if it is a mul binary classification then you would always say that uh, it, this is class 0 with a probability of 60 percent and hence it is class 1 with a probability of 40 percent. So, always need to get that probability thing I mean that notion of probability into your setup when you are doing classification. Now, if you do linear layer for example, then it will be like whatever w transpose x plus v will come you will pass it through a linear layer and the same w transpose x plus v will come out as output. This w transpose x plus v has no notion of probability this can be of course, this can be negative, this can be positive, this can go, go up grow to 1000, 10000 whatever. So, in that case your model would not be I mean you would not be able to assign a probability to W transpose x plus b if you have a linear layer at the end. So, that is why you would always prefer to have a sigmoid sort of a connection for, uh, for uh, classification. Now, uh, sir, yeah. one question here. Yeah. But in uh, SVM last year hmm. week what we learned, hmm. so we do uh, even there we just have a linear decision bound right, but right. still it is able to classify without probability. Right, so in SVMs, uh, so yeah that, that is why SVMs are a different sort of classifiers, SVMs do not look at this from the point of view of so, uh, so SVMs will not ever give you a probability saying that ok. Uh, this point has a 60 percent probability of belonging to class 0. It will say that ok, this is either class 0 or class 1, correct? Yes, sir. Now, uh, for, a, uh, for neural networks, for neural networks, how do you learn the things? For neural networks, you learn the things in the way like ok, this is something, then you will have such neurons. Towards the end, you will come up with these neurons, and this is your output, let us say this becomes your output y hat right. Then you would have some error function correct, you would have some error function which might be y hat minus w for y hat minus y whole square for, uh, for regression. For classification you will have the same output as in logistic regression sorry this is for classification your uh, for classification your error function would be something like this. Sorry. Okay. This would be your error function if you are trying to do classification with uh, neural networks. So, you have to understand that neural networks and SVMs are different. Okay. Neural networks are very closely re related to uh, are very closely related, related to this uh, logistic uh, logistic regression models and uh, that is why it is it has been said that for ANN classification what do you want you want you want this loss function you want to optimize this loss function and therefore for as in logistic regression you would also want a uh, notion of probability to be assigned to your y hat your y hat cannot be just anything. Yeah. 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 I am coming to all those. I am coming to all. Those. Yeah. I am all. I am coming to all those. Yeah. So, 
now sigmoid will bring it perfectly between 0 and 1 that is fine ok then there is uh, now uh, what is for example let let us look at tan h tan h if you look then tan h will be something like this now this is minus 1 I think and this is plus 1 so tan h will be something like this so this also you can say that ok I can consider this to be uh, a sort of uh, a, I mean you can you can you cannot say that this has, has a probability a notion to it but you can say ok this is my threshold value above this threshold value everything will be a particular class below this threshold value ed everything will be another particular class. For example, if you have something like linear, so linear is this you had what could you have said about this uh, I mean uh, you could have you could not have said anything about this linear value right because this on this particular end it goes on increasing on this particular end and in this particular end it goes on decreasing and you cannot assign you uh, one thing which you can say is ok if this is greater than 0 then this is class 1 if it is less than 0 then it is class 0. But uh, that you could have said of course in linear but uh, that I would I mean then you would say that ok whenever w transpose x plus b is greater than 0 this is positive whenever a uh, positive class when this is w transpose x plus b is less than 0 then that is actually a negative class. So, that is actually another uh, algorithm, but uh, that is a that is not used in ANNs that is never used for neural networks that is used for very simple classification ok. So, uh, uh, ok. So, we can use tan h or no? Yeah, you can use tan h. Only for certain or but not for probabilistic classification. No, you can use tan h for probabilistic classification generally it is seldom used, but you can use saying that ok after 0 I will say that it is plus 1 before 0 you can say that it is minus 1 ok see but nothing like point nothing like sigmoid like uh, nothing point like point. nothing like sigmoid nothing like sigmoid yes or, or soft max or softmax and softmax I, I do not know whether softmax was taught in this lecture, but softmax is just a variant of sigmoid. So, soft, softmax is generally used for multi class classification ok. So, I do not think that was taught in this I mean that it is uh, it was not taught. So, I will also not go into the details of this, but just remember softmax is the multi class version. So, uh, so uh, uh, where did I draw it? Yeah, so here if you see I had drawn only one neuron right. So, that means that ok. So, let me draw it like this. So, suppose you have a big neural network this is your big neural network towards the end this is the last layer that I am drawing ok. You have one neuron this is another neural network and this is for two class classification this is for a two class classification ok this is another neural network. Now, you use the same neural network for the same problem with two uh, with uh, two uh, neurons towards the end this is also for two class classification. So, basically the difference between these two they are do solving exactly the same problem it is it is everything is the same except that here what you are doing your loss function will change and your outputs of course um, and the um, and the outputs also will be uh, will be changed. So, here your outputs will be either 1 or 0. So, if it is class 1 then it will be 1 if you if it is class 0 it will be class 0 that is 1. Here your outputs will be a vector. So, your outputs for can be like this or can be like this. So, this 1 corresponds to this and this 0 corresponds to this similarly this 0 corresponds to this and this 1 corresponds to this. These are the exact two things exact similar things. Now, however, if you look at neural if you look at classification problems from this perspective then this gives you a very easy extension to multi class problems like you will have this 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 this. So, these are your 5 classes now and your vectors will always be one hot I mean let us let us consider them to be one hot they might not always be one hot, but let us consider them to be one hot right and 
so the uh, so this is this is one so now if you understand i mean uh, now if you see here then what happens is i mean i hope this was clear this formulation was clear and this is used for multi class classification yeah any questions sir can you tell some examples for the first case second case and third case uh, in terms of vectors you say in first you have said uh, either one or zero yeah can you tell some examples to prove that we can yeah so for uh, for two two cat uh, for two class classification let's say i am having that famous cat dog example cat dog classifier and you say that your cat is class 1 class 0 and your dog is class 1 correct you can you can of course look at the problem like this you can interchange the two classes nobody stops you from doing that but let's say you have chosen that cat is class 0 and dog is class 1 so whenever you have you have a input of cat you will say that my output will be zero whenever you have a input of dog you will say my output is one right in the second case when you have cat your output should be close to 10 when you have giving in dog your output should be closer to 01 is it clear now and uh, of course cat dog classifier now you will now you can understand right uh, la, now for example you have a three class classifier where you classify between cat dog and tiger so now your you will have three neurons here and your outputs can be 0 0 1 0 0 0 1 1 0 0 so these are the three possible outputs that you can get thank you now uh, just know so for sir, the yeah. difference between first two examples both are binary classifiers but the first one is using is using softmax uh yes yes yeah so uh, now for sigmoid what happens is for sigmoid just because the way sigmoid is defined sigmoid will always say okay if 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 this particular example has a probability of 60% of being of a particular class that means the other class is of automatically 40% therefore this all uh, this so that is the way sigmoid is defined for here but here you can you cannot do certain i mean if you have two neurons if you have two neurons then how do you ensure the same thing that softmax allows you to do okay so that softmax will yeah so so, so yes, soft sir is softmax and soft plus both the same uh soft plus is different from soft uh, softmax soft plus is different from soft max okay? okay so soft max is uh, so soft max is basically something uh, so i'll just wi plus 1 plus e to the power of wi x so soft max is something like this okay so sorry this one won't be there very sorry this one won't be there so that is the way softmax is uh, defined uh, but don't worry about it softmax is not a part of this course so i won't go into i mean nobody will ask you about softmax just know that softmax is the is similar very similar to sigmoid except that it is used for multi class classification problems okay so the next question is uh, the threshold function can be used as an activation function for the hidden layers so that is a statement that somebody is making and the reason is threshold functions Okay, so the question is cannot be used as an activation function, and the threshold functions do not introduce nonlinearity. So uh, first, uh, tell me whether the statement is true. Can threshold functions be used as activation functions? Yes, sir, it can be used. Okay, so. uh for uh, so if if you go through the lecture then what were the two conditions which were given for introducing uh, activation functions in linear in neural networks i mean why was it introduced in the first place we were very happy with linear then why did we introduce activation functions or sigmoid relu was also talked about nonlinearity correct so threshold functions introduce nonlinearity right okay what was the other condition that was uh, i mean 
uh, I mean how do how how would you learn neural networks? What what is the algorithm that is used for learning training neural networks? Gradient descent. Right. So for gradient, right. So for gradient descent, uh, what is the first requirement that you need for gradient descent? You should have a decent gradient. Gradient vanishing should not be there. Property should be low. Uh -huh. So if you have a threshold function, what can you say about its gradient? Gradient is yeah. so you can't learn yes, so this function is not differentiable, correct? So, because of that, although threshold functions introduce nonlinearity, we can't use threshold functions as uh, activation functions in uh, neural networks. So, the statement is true, but the reason is false. Okay. Now, let me tell you the most famous activation function that is used till date. I mean this came out long back, but it is still being used that is this activation function. This was also referred to in the class and this is known as the rectified linear unit or the ReLU activation function. This is the most common activation function that you will find and you see that the function is not differentiable here. The function is not differentiable. Is it, is it, is it clear to everybody that the function will not be differentiable here? Whenever you have such sort of a um, uh, such sort of a arm sort of a, I mean sharp bend sort of a thing it will not be differentiable. Okay? So, the ReLU function is not differentiable, yet it is the most widely used uh, widely used um, uh, non-linearity or the activation function that is that is there because and that is because there is something known as sub gradients. It is differentiable after x greater than 0. Yeah, so that is also true for this case. It is differentiable everywhere here, it is differentiable everywhere here. The, de the derivative is 0. 0. So, that means no gradient no uh -huh. So, that is the next point that I would have come to. So, sub gradients is the reason why where you can still get away with uh, no, a small non differentiability in your domain that is one thing, but sub gradients of course, is not part of this. The other important thing is as somebody said very rightly pointed out. You see, you are using all these linear, linear, non-linear, whatever activation functions you are using. At the end of the day, you would like to, um, you would like to learn your neural network. Your, if your neural network doesn't learn, then you dark, then you don't, do, then you are not doing anything. Now you see what happens is now sigmoid. For example, sigmoid has a non-zero gradient here. But very quickly, because you will see that sigmoid is a, has an exponential somewhere, I mean in the denominator, I mean the way it has an exponential involved. So, very quickly it, it saturates. The, so, the gradient at this level and, the, and this level will all be 0, very close to 0. So, when your w transpose x plus b sigma w transpose x plus when, when you take this, even if it go, grows only slightly, this the gradient of this will go down to 0. The gradient of this will go down to 0. Similarly, that will be the case with tan h. However, ReLU you see a large portion or the positive portion of it at least, there is, it is linear there. So, whatever I mean if you are farther away from 0, the, far, the larger your gradient would be. So, what it will try to do is it will always, it will always provide a gradient when you are in the positive half of the when you are in the positive quadrant. Of course, when you go down to 0, then you will I mean if you are negative, then it will go down to there will be no gradient because of that. So, uh, because in order to solve that people have come up with different active a uh, slight variant of uh, ReLU which is known as leaky ReLU which is like this. This slope is much lesser than this slope. I mean the neg on the negative side because this is another activation function. This is known as leaky ReLU. So, here you receive a gradient even when you are in the negative half of the 
x axis. So, always remember that for activation functions there are two things first of all it should be more or less differentiable uh, that is one the other thing is it should its gradient its gradient should not be 0 for a large part of the x axis if that is the case then your network would not learn anything at all. So, uh, that is another important uh, thing that I wanted to tell from this question. I have one, I have one just clarification of what you wrote because yeah. it is not clear on my screen. Yeah. This sigma w transpose x, what is this h 0? No, uh, I am okay. I am saying that for a large portion of the x axis, the, the derivative of this function would be equal to 0. Yeah. And you know what is this uh, uh, w transpose t x and what is next h? No, that is b, the bias. Oh, bias, plus bias. Plus bias, yes, yes. Plus b. Okay, it looks like h, so I oh. was confused. Oh, no, 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 it is plus b. w transpose x yeah. plus b. Yeah. And just one a generalization, yeah. every vector is always presented as a row matrix, I am sorry as a col column matrix right, that is the convention? That is the convention, you can change that, nobody stops you from changing okay, that. Okay, but then, then, then because it is easy to do w transpose t x, otherwise it will be ulta I suppose x transpose w. Ha ha. I mean that that is up to you the way you, I mean generally it is always the, it is always told that uh, it is it's a column vector, a vector means a column vector. Okay, so the other question, I think this is the last question. Yeah, so on different initializations of your neural network, you get significantly different values of loss. What could be the reason for this? So, what can be the reason for this? Is it option D, sir? Option D, okay. Anybody has any other answers? Insert option D. Yes, it's correct. So, uh, so depending on so if your loss curve loss curve looks something like this, then if you start here, you might end up here. If you start start here, you might end up here. If you start here, you might end up here. You may never reach the global minima, which is this. And because of that, whenever depending on your starting point, you are actually uh, getting different values of the loss function and uh, because of the multiple local minima that exist in the loss curve. Okay, so that was it. So now any questions you can ask. Some clarification on yeah. the current assignment. I think I just want to clarify some whether these are typo errors or they really meant. Like in current assignment question 1. Okay, I let me uh, current assignment means which assignment? Assignment. You are supposed to submit tomorrow. Uh, no, tell me the number of this assignment. Assignment five or four. Assignment, assignment six. number six, I think. Okay, okay. Six, six. Okay, let me try to open this. And for some reason I find the questions of the assignments to be very vague in certain cases. So Yeah, but I am I am not asking about vagueness, I am just asking about some I think there are some typo errors or whether I am interpreting it wrong. Take question one. Just a minute, just a minute. Okay. Let me log in. Yeah, you can go ahead. Okay, 1D, see all the weights are W0, W1, W2 and in 1D we have W3, is it just a typo or, or uh, something else? Oh, week 6, right? Okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, I opened week 5, sorry. Just a minute. Week 5 vector uh, machine. Uh -huh. okay. Week 6 or 1 during it. Hmm. 
yeah uh, 1d okay so find the appropriate weights for w0 w1 and w2 to represent the and function threshold function equal to 1 if output is greater than 0 0 otherwise x0 and x1 are the inputs and v1 equal to 1 is the bias yeah so what is their doubt the in 1d option huh they have given w3 as a weight there is no w3 weight so i think i should take it as w2, w2 yeah 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 that should so be w2 big typo and, and same thing in question 2 ha so question b w3 should be w2 yeah w2 yeah. and w2 okay 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 then it's fine uh, no uh, and w2 should be w1 i suppose see to be W0 ha W2 should be W1 and W3 should be W2 yeah yeah because i was under some impression that you know since W3 is a redundant weight just ignore it no 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 it should be W2 yeah okay, okay. yeah this is quite a quite a serious error yeah i say exam may i got them we will get wrong <laughs> you can ask you can say in the forum that uh, you can ask in the forum also the okay. The TAs who will set the who are actually setting the question will come to know of the typos. Okay, yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, any other doubts? Sir, I have one doubt yeah. regarding the uh, like uh, we have hit layers in neural networks. We have hidden layers, yes. and in each layer, we have number of hidden units. Right. Right. What is the difference between if you increase the number of hidden layers versus increasing the number of hidden units in that hidden layer? So, which one causes more overfitting? This is this is uh, I mean nobody can answer this actually. <laughs> it depends on the problem setting. It depends on your input data. In it depends on your uh, I mean it depends on everything. It depends on your data basically. It depends on how how many neurons you are using, how many uh, how many uh, layers you have stacked, and all those. I mean that is why for neural networks uh, validation set. I mean choosing all of this is very important from the point because you want to want to have a validation set, and that validation set will help you choose all these. So how do you choose, sir? Like example, if this if there is more bias, hmm. so which means it is underfitting. So in that case, huh. we want to little bit in improve the uh, uh, right. model. So right. Right. What would we choose? To increase one more layer or uh, generally? More uh, I mean, generally there are very. Um, what should I say? So, for example, if you are coding this, I am now talking up from the point of view of coding a neural network, coding up a neural network. So, what uh, what happens generally in coding is you would uh, ask your uh, you will give the model you will give the python package so uh, so, so there is something known as sk learn so which is the short form for scikit learn so you will give this python package you will say that okay this is a validation set and let's say you say that okay i will have uh, 10 i i can have either two layers three layers and i can go up to a maximum of five layers okay you can you these are your number of uh, layers hidden layers and for each of these layers i would have either um, let's say uh, 5 neurons 10 neurons 20 neurons 50 neurons number of neurons per layer right then you can ask sklearn to run all these configurations so it will it will first fix the number of layers to 2 and check with 5 neurons 10 neurons 20 neurons 50 neurons then it will set the number of layers to 3 again check for 5 10 10 20 therefore you will have some 40 different uh, 40 different for each of one of them you will have four combinations four uh, number of neurons so out of this uh, out of this uh, what uh, 16 combinations the best uh, the best uh, what should I say uh, number of neurons and the number of layer combination will be returned to you by sklearn. sklearn is what is a software? Yeah, it's a python package it stands for scikit-learn. So, is it, uh, is it on the is it, uh, uh, what is it on the internet on the yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. it's free everything no no everything in python is free. So, 
this is free so you can just ask it to do all these things and it will uh, do it on its own and give you the best possible configuration that you want based on your um, uh, based on your uh, this thing uh, based on your validation set then the validation set performance that you get you use that and use it for your testing okay it's a lot of trial and error that goes into uh, fixing the number of neurons number of layers yeah okay uh, so should you use grid search for ha 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 generally they generally they will always you uh, they will always use uh, some sort of a grid search algorithm but uh, i mean for uh, nowadays what people do is because the neural network training has become very very time consuming they generally never use grid search anymore grid search can be used uh, i mean grid search i don't think is again taught in this but uh, yeah so grid search can be used but only when your neural network training time is very low uh, other other than that uh, you are not uh, you will not use grid search so what is what is the reason you know it is because so we are doing this thing now things are not in circuit learning huh you are using this things in things are we are not using circuit learn nowadays practically okay in tensor flow i mean for neural network for uh, normal neural network you should you should not use tensor flow i mean it's an overkill for that because tensor flow is a very heavy software uh, so you can use scikit learn for normal neural networks uh, tensor flow i have i have not in touch with tensor flow right now so i won't be able to tell the exact package uh, what should we use uh, apart from grid search Oh, for for uh, for all these things, for uh, for uh, fixing. Oh, you just use trial and error. I you I for my all my experiments, I always use only trial and error because uh, my training examples. Uh, for when I train my own models, it would take me three days to train one model, and uh, so there is no way of using. Uh, uh, there is no other way of using. Uh, I mean, I will just fix fix certain things which I think. will be better and then i go ahead and use those things for if your if your neural network training time is very low then you can go ahead and use grid search only that would suffice by 3 days you mean 3 uh, into 24 hours yeah 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 running all the, the computers running processes are running throughout the night throughout the night yes sir uh, i Hello? have a doubt yeah okay. Uh, in deep learning, hmm. ma'am said something about feature extraction app happens at each hidden layer. Right, right. Uh, can you please explain that process? Ha. Huh, so uh, you can see, you can think of. So uh, okay. So so let's talk about logistic regression. So you had x one, you had x two. these were your features which you had given to logistic regression you multiplied that with some w you added that with b you got w transpose x plus b you got sigma of w transpose x plus b this was your output correct is this clear yes sir now now with if this is clear then suppose these are your inputs now this is your hidden layer okay so this is your hidden layer so one layer of neural network is lying in here so this is w1 b1 this are z1 z2 up to zn let's say and now you are again doing the same thing you are doing a w transpose z plus b and you are taking and you are taking a sigmoid of on top of that and this becomes your output now this part is nothing but logistic regression this from z1 till the output is nothing but logistic regression however the way you got z1 was actually you you actually manipulated x1 up to xn with some weights and some nonlinearity so extract some better features for classification and this better features is basically learned because you are learning this w1 b1 now you are getting z1 z2 up to zn you are doing this sigmoid function 
and you are predicting like in logistic regression. So that is why we can say that okay, these Z1, Z2 are basically features that you are extracting from the original inputs because this W1, B1 is again learned so that it helps you in classification. Therefore, you are getting better features for classification as compared to X1 to Xn. That is why these are known as the, the, the initial layers of neural networks are, are called they are, those are the feature extraction layers. Is it fine now? Is it clear? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Okay. Hello. Yeah. I'm audible. Uh, can you give me a what, how how approach? Suppose there is simple problem of circuitry Ohm's law, and that's uh, if we given uh, arbitrary circuits, so how we can implement uh, uh, neural network in this case to solve any circuitry? How we should approach modeling? Actually, I wanted to ask uh, how. You are you are trying to model. Um, uh, you are trying suppose to uh, we huh. Ohm's law. We simply we use in circuit. This is circuit suppose we are taking right, and there is only one voltage current source. But if we give any arbitrary circuit, huh. like conventionally there is a program and a simulator are there. But I am not talking that. Huh. If we wanted to handle this problem as a neural network machine learning approach, how we could handle? It? What should be our approach like? So. In that case, see the first thing in neural network uh, or in any machine learning approach, you would need to have a large amount of data, right? So, mm -hmm. suppose you have some voltage source, some I1, you have all these outputs, uh, sorry, all these inputs, okay, and these are your outputs, let us say the resistances are your outputs. So, V and I it should be our, uh, our register circuitry is given like most things. So no, I mean uh, wh what do you, uh, I mean for neural networks you would want. Even, suppose you wanted to find a current as output or output voltage, input voltage we know and circuitry. Is huh, so, you can just interchange, I mean you can say that okay this is R1 and this is V1 let us say, okay and this is R2, this is V2, this is Rn, this is Vn. I mean it depends upon you how you want to give the inputs and uh, if your inputs are like this then you will feed in I mean um, uh, so this, I mean, this is this will be like what this will be uh, you would feed in I1 you would feed in R1 and uh, you would uh, ask the neural network you will maybe um, so, if you want to do this by neural network, if you want to do that, then uh, you can do something like, uh, yeah, so you can do something like this and uh, the output of this will is supposed to be V1 or if this is Ij, this is Rj, the output of this is supposed to be Vj and uh, yeah, so then you can have such weights and uh, so uh, ideally what will happen is uh, so uh, I mean this would be learned very simply right. So, if you if you optimize this by neural networks uh, then what will happen is uh, probably this will come out to be uh, uh, you have i into r you have i into r right. So, yeah, so no, uh, my only the curiosity is that uh -huh. is it a, that model after learning it is it converging to the V equal to I R Ohm's law. Uh -huh, it, it will converge, it will converge depending uh -huh. on how many weights you give. If it why we give arbitrary circuit, no, no, and number of uh, arbitrary number of nodes and complex circuitry, will it able to solve or not? That's yeah, I, I mean, I, I do not think anybody has checked this, but I think it will be able to solve, yeah. Just uh, yeah. uh, somebody asked a question about how is this feature extraction, huh. uh, how does hidden level do fit feature extraction? Yes, yes. Uh, is it necessary for this hidden layer to be a convolution layer to be to do feature extraction? No, convolutional layers are very specific uh, neural networks, or, I mean they are very specialized neural networks that are used for, 
हाँ दैट आर यूज फॉर कोड भी विजुलाइज्ड इन इमेज प्रोसेसिंग कर लो आई यस सो न्यूरल नेटवर्क्स आर वेरी बेसिक स्टफ दे आर यूज्ड फॉर वेरी सिंपल स्टफ एंड फॉर सो फॉर यूजिंग आई मीन फॉर फॉर प्रोसेसिंग इमेजेस यू वो जनरली रिक्वायर अ न्यूरल अ कॉन्वोल्यूशनल न्यूरल नेटवर्क so in that case all these the hidden layers in between would be replaced by convolutional neural convolutional filters if i may call them so yeah they can be also convolutional layers yeah the that you say that uh, hidden layers do, are tantamount to doing nothing else but feature extraction and if your features are the input layer say x1 x2 up to xn right what What are the features? What does the feature extraction mean? This x1 to xn, out of which a few features become dominant and the rest become passive. That is the meaning of the word feature extraction. That is the ideal, yeah. So that is the meaning of feature extraction. But in other ways, you can also you can also see that uh, I mean because of the way a neural network is stacked, uh, it can it can arbitrarily find out any. Non-linear combination of this x1 to xn, which becomes very important for classification. Now, if you are, I mean, uh, if I mean, uh, neural networks, the hidden layers can be considered the feature extractors only when you think of the last layer of the neural network to be a logistic regression model. So, suppose you had x1 to xn, and some li- non linear combination of x1 to xn would have given you a very good classification just on logistic regression uh, may i add something uh, no let me complete okay. so x1 to xn you have those inputs N- then you have some non linear combination of this x1 to xn to get z1 to zn with those z1 if you had provided those z1 to zn as your inputs to a logistic regression model you would have gone the same thing you would have got a very good accuracy however what neural networks are doing is they are take they are taking the same input as a logistic regression but they are changing the inputs in such a way that it becomes very suitable for classification now let me uh, come to this point so last time when uh, the last week when we were thinking about svms right so svm towards the end th- what was the kernel trick of svm all about so we knew that okay svms can only do svms can only do uh, the linear classification Lin- when the problem is linearly separable svms can solve it but most in most cases problems won't be linearly separable so what they what we try to do was we try to move to a high dimensional space everybody remembers this right yes we went to a higher dimensional space and in that higher dimensional space the problem became linearly separable now here you see what is happening is this kernel thing this kernel i mean these inputs are given to you so you can't change those the kernel is also defined i mean of course you can have a choice of kernels but once you choose a kernel you al- already know what this particular point will map to in the higher dimensional space right am i correct yes yes sir yeah right so uh, so the kernel gave you a way of moving to a higher dimensional space but you were not learning anything you were you knew that okay this is the kernel that i have chosen this is my input point this would be my higher dimensional output point now neural networks actually think of i mean you can think of neural networks as a combination of all the ideas that you have learned before so what neural networks are effectively doing is they are taking some features x1 to xn you can't change these somebody has given that to you i mean to the neural network somebody has given this x1 to xn it can't change these it learns it learns the so in the svms what was happening was we did it by means of a kernel here we do it by means of learning and we move on to some other space which might be z1 to zn which may even be lower dimensional higher dimensional doesn't matter so you go you go from x x x space to z space and then you see okay in z space now this becomes maybe this becomes linearly separable and then you add a logistic regression on top of it this is a logistic regression and you classify 
So because of the way you are transforming the features, you can think of the lower layers of neural network as feature extractors. Okay, so the higher dimensional features are discovered by your neural network without you having to do, you, you are not doing anything, you are just putting in some weights, it is learning on its own, moving it to, to some higher dimensional space, to some lower dimensional space where the points are becoming linearly separable. regarding uh, CNN right sir yeah so this will be like can you explain a little bit in details sir like we what is flattening or uh, uh, for max cooling on those operations right. in yeah. CNN yeah so uh, are CNNs uh, very I mean are CNNs a part of the assignment also yes. yes oh is it okay I thought the way CNNs were taught it won't be a part of assignment anyway okay so only one or two questions, not uh, uh, right, right, right. Yeah. Why is this happening? Okay. So now we are talking about convolutional neural networks. Now see. Uh, what is, sorry, sorry, sorry. I'll share my screen again. Sir, please uh, share your screen. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, for some reason, I got disconnected. Sir, what is our role when we use neural networks, sir? Only weight assignment? Yeah. And uh, sometimes architecture selection. Okay, okay, sir. Yeah. So, weight assignment you won't do, right? I mean, it will learn its learn on its own. Mm, then it is just the data which we feed. Right. So, find out how many layer, hidden uh, layer, yes, yes. when we get the required output. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, yeah, so uh, so far uh, CNNs, so the one the one thing which you have to realize here is so why we why we needed to go to the CNN networks, I mean convolutional neural networks. So uh, let's say we have uh, let's say we have this this is the normal ANNs or the normal neural networks that you are talking about that that was taught mostly, and you are classifying this as. Uh, classifying this as so uh, yeah so you are classifying this okay now let's say you have a problem where uh, your job is to find whether a particular image contains a face of a person or not okay so there are many images of sceneries and uh, there are many images of persons of faces of persons uh, on it and you are trying to classify whether the uh, whether the picture has a person person's face or not. So, let us say I am I will draw a person's face, it will not look like a face, but you have to imagine that, that this is the person's face okay? and uh, this is the scenery. So, some heart is there, okay? uh, this is not, uh, some heart, something, something and some trees and all those things are there. Okay? Now, <coughs> so if you remember in the beginning, in the first lecture only I had told something like one thing which you can do is all images at the end of the day are just matrix are as as some matrices okay so let's say i have a 30 32 cross 32 image and this is also 32 cross 32 and i say that okay 32 cross 32 some certain certain number is there okay 784 so i flatten all of them and I uh, and I make uh, so so I will have 784 values. I feed in the 784 values and try to classify whether this whether zero or one. Okay, I try to classify this. 
<coughs> so that is the way you would go about this problem you, you would think of this problem if you have a neural network. Now people came up with another idea that ok so let me do something like I will have so this is my image and so if this is let us say 32 cross 32 I will have a small block of matrix. So, let us say this is a uh, this is 32 cross 32 there is no more channels this is there is no RGB channel here. So, these are black and white images let us say. So, you have a small block which is let us say 3 cross 3. So, you move this Uh, so, this is a 3 cross 3 matrix ok and all these weights this 3 cross 3 this 9 weights these are learnable ok these are learnable w 1 w 2 w 3 up to dot dot w 9 these are all learnable weights you first pass it through this image here ok you pass it here then you so uh, so after that what you do is after that so, once you pass it with the you, you convolve or not convolve, so you multiply with the image uh, pixel values with this learnable weights and you get one value ok. This is your, here I am drawing the output, so you get one value. Then you shift this particular filter by stride of 1, this is I mean the amount of shift is known as stride. Okay, amount of shift is known as stride. So, you pass the next weight here, then you get another value. Again, you pass the weight by 1, you uh, you get another value and so on. So, in this way, you can, you can, you, you will see and then once you reach towards this end, then you move it down, then you move it here. You again down it, uh, you, you shift it by 1 on the vertical side and again move and do, do similar things. Okay. So, is the Con is, is the operation of convolution clear till now? Sir, can you please repeat it sir? Ok, so actually this would have been easier if I had some slides. Uh, so, what is happening is you have, so this is your learnable weight, this is learnable and this is your image. So, you first take this I will say that you take this w, you take this here ok, you multiply so you can. So, that learnable weight need not be 3 cross 3 right? It can no, no it can be anything, uh, it can be anything okay. yeah. Okay. So, you have these 9 weights, you have this you have 9 pixel values of the image at these 9 positions, you multiply all of them you get certain value let us say you get 10. Suppose I mean you have done something you have taken some uh, linear activation or non-linear activation whatever you have done and you have got 10. So, now so I. So, initially you select those weights, we select those weights right sir. So, it is it's like neural networks, those. it's like neural okay. networks you initialize the weights to some values. Random values. Right? Random values ok. So, now you the first value that you have got here is 10. So, you put 10 here. Then what you do is you shift this by one place to the right. So, earlier it was here. So, now it will be here. Got it sir. So, this is how we repeat for 32 cross 32 image. Right. So, I mean for the entire image you will, uh, so there are more, uh, I mean there, there are some more details to it. So, what happens for example, the, since this is 3 cross 3, so what will happen when you reach to the let us say um, to the 29th time that you have gone here. So, then 20, uh, not 29, let us say 30th time you have gone here. Ok, not even 30, let us say you have gone to the 31st value. So, now your image has 30, 31 and 32, these are your two values left and you have put your, you are putting your kernel here, I mean these are known as kernels, these learnable weights. So, you can understand right, what is happening? That, that you, amount of shift no, uh -huh. stride. That is stride, yeah. It can be any value, 1, 2, any value, how we can? Uh, yeah, all these things will have to be done by means of, uh, by means of looking at the validation set. Okay. Okay, and uh, I mean that is the actual thing that we need to do. But as I said, most people don't change those things right now because of the time that it involves. 
So, so what happens towards the end is uh, you can see here so that this is a 3 cross 3 kernel and you have reached to the 31st position. So, that means you, you have I mean it can your image is only up to 32. Is this clear to everybody? Yes, the sir. problem here. So, here what you will do is you will pad this is known as padding. You will pad your uh, your pa you will pad your images with zeros. So always we need to use the zero padding. Yeah. Um, uh, not always. I mean, if you uh, if you choose your uh, stride or something uh, stride stride pool uh, the, the 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 width and the length of the kernel the width and the height of the kernel in certain ways, then of course you don't need to use padding, but in most cases people will use padding ok. Ok, so yeah, so that is how you will get all these numbers and so that is how you will get all these numbers. So, uh, so let us say I have one filter ok, I have one filter which I am calling as k 1 which is a 3 cross 3 matrix ok and you will get one set of outputs for this ok. I mean one set of output means you will get I mean I am talking about these things ok. So, one k 1 will give you one set of uh, uh, it will give you another matrix of certain dimension. So, you do not need to worry about the dimension you will get some matrix of some dimension based on the values that you choose for k 1. Now, you can also take another value k 2 which is also let us say 3 cross 3 it will give you another value or another matrix. Similarly, you can take k n such values ok and here k huh, yeah see you were saying something hello k uh, I am not get uh, is everybody able to hear or is it my problem yes. We can hear you. No, I, I, I mean, can you hear the question? What she is saying? Oh, okay, I can repeat, sir. Yeah, yeah. Are you able repeat. to hear me now? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so, okay. is K one, K two? They are all the weight matrix, right, sir? They are the weight matrices. Yes. Okay. okay. Yes. So then, what you will have is you will uh, so. Now, uh, a very simple comparison will tell you. So, for example, here you had seven eighty four neurons right. So, these were 784 in number let us say these are what these are um, let us say 100 pixel values. Those are the pixel values. Huh, 784 are the pixel values you designed a normal neural network with 100 hidden layers in between. So, this leads to 784 into 100 weights ok 784 into 100 weights you have you you get contrast this with the convolutional neural networks this same nine weights you had convolved over the entire image it just finally you had to learn just nine weights this also you are learning just nine weights this also you are learning just nine weights so what is happening here is even and what is the k in server uh -huh. Huh. So, so, so that you have to understand that even for a simple neural network with so first of all images nowadays would be uh, would never be 32 cross 32 it is generally 224 cross 224. So, you can imagine that if this has gone up by what almost 8 times almost 8 times or 7 times. So, this also will go up by 49 times right. So, this 780 this 784 will increase up to 224 cross 224. So, that itself is a huge number on top of that if you have a fully connected layer. So, these are known as fully connected layers if you have a fully connected layer then you are increasing the weight by such a large amount it is 784 into 100 even for this. On the other hand for convolutional neural networks for each filter you are adding just 9 weights I am ignoring biases. So, I am just adding I am just considering weights right now. So, you have just 9 weights for one filter. So, just imagine how many number of filters you can introduce in such a way 
okay that is one that is uh, so your neural networks can now become very deep you can have many such k1 to kns and you can stack them up in multiple different ways your number of weights won't uh, won't uh, grow up by that by such a large amount okay is this is this point clear so this k1 to kn uh, huh. is it like they are we are cascading those layers sir so once from no what inputs, what you will yeah so what you will do is you will have those inputs right so k1 will work on the inputs k2 will work on the same inputs kn will work on the same inputs so let's say you have uh, suppose your output matrices are all um, uh, output matrices are all let's say 28 cross 28 so after doing all these convolutional thing you have got 28 cross 28 stuff okay so now what you will do is you will stack this 28 cross 28 along the channel dimension so you will stack all of them so that this becomes 28 cross 28 cross oh 32 cross 32 is actually 1024 28 cross 28 is 784 sorry yeah so 28 cross 28 would be uh, and after stacking all of them this would become 28 cross 28 cross n is it clear now how you would okay so stacking means all these are parallel in that one stage right exactly sir? and okay. and that is one more advantage what you can do is you can think of k1 to k1 up to kn as massive parallelization of your model so because k1 doesn't depend on kn k1 to kn can occur um, uh, can occur parallelly i mean can occur independently of each other so while k1 is processing k2 is also you can start processing k2 you can also start processing kn k3 up to kn as and when your uh, gpu core becomes uh, it becomes feasible for you to use your cores gpu cores so then and this process is called convolution yeah yes yes i mean this process is not called i mean this process i should not say that it is called convolution because convolution has a very specific meaning in signal processing and uh, so this is not that convolution in the true sense uh, but uh, for convolutional neural networks this is the way things are learned okay so first of all the first advantage is since you are sharing weights so this is also known as sharing weights you are using the same weights 3 cross 3 weights for processing all the parts of the image okay uh, so because of that your number of weights are reducing per filter and if the number of weights are reducing per filter you can have much more number of filters uh, for processing your image that is the first advantage the second advantage is as you see i mean that people have realized with time what is happening is see this weights I mean for example for example suppose this weight this this 3 cross 3 whatever thing is there so suppose this has learned something like this I mean it can learn completely different things but suppose it has learned something like this okay so suppose k1 has learned this and suppose k2 has learned something like this okay what does this mean this means that in my image whenever there is a vertical a vertical edge let's say a vertical line so this part will be black this part will be black there is certain white stuff going in here this kernel would be able to pick that out because it is you see what will happen is when it is i mean suppose my image is something like this where there is a small edge here so when this kernel operates on this image when when this comes here it will say that okay i uh, so because all of them are zeros only this part is one it will pick out this white block here and it will start figuring out okay these are my vertical edges similarly if i had a vertical edge here then the same kernel would be able to pick out this vertical edge also is it clear 
sir how will it pick up the last one sir because huh. the, the only the central um the middle column is one right but uh, here the one appears in the end of right so grid. so my vertical edge is here my vertical edge is here okay right now consider this kernel this has gone here so okay this has gone here suppose this is the midpoint of this kernel of this box it will pick out this edge correct right now this kernel is moving right this kernel is moving this way this kernel is also moving this way so suppose okay, it has okay, come here then it moves here then it moves here then it doesn't find anything but of course at one point of time it will move here right so then it will catch that image then it will catch that vertical edge so because of that what happens is your kernels I, I mean people have seen this i mean of course i don't know whether this was intended but people have seen this that your kernels become very i mean all these filters all these filters they become very very sensitive to certain features of your image okay and because of the way the certain features are there in the image this helps us in image classification now why why is that as i yeah you told about this uh, face example right hmm. so sub suppose i have one question here yeah. suppose you want to classify two things one is a, a normal a face okay right so another one is some deformities in the in the face so now i want to classify the normal face and deformities wherever it is located i want to uh, identify and classify separately hmm hmm Okay. Hmm. So here the feature extraction. Hmm. Whether particularly I have to go for any technique, I will implement it. Otherwise, the neural network itself will identify and tell me. So this is a normal face. This is a deformed face. Something like that. Yeah. So what will happen is, for example, uh, you have. Uh, this is actually an excellent question. Okay. This is. Okay. Suppose you have something like this. Okay. you have these two eyes here right yeah. and your neural network is moving some something like this your neural network is moving like this right yeah. so this neural network i mean of course you have to understand that this is not the only kernel that will work on your image there will be other kernels also yeah. suppose you will have a kernel which uh, with which has a stride which has a stride of let's say which is a big stride let's say so which has this bigger stride okay so this kernel would be a, this kernel would be able to understand okay whenever this this particular combination i mean this particular um, orientation of not orientation i should i shouldn't say orientation this particular uh, pixels i mean eyes eyes will have a particular pixel value as compared to the rest of your face let's say so whenever these combinations of pixels appear very close to one another okay. that means that that is a face okay so they will be able to classify it as face okay? okay however the question that you asked is suppose i give you a suppose i give you a face like this okay where the two eyes are here okay. right and i give you another face which is like the same dimension let's say one eye is like this one eye is like this mm. any human being any human being will be able to say that this is not a face yes. right this is not a face mm. however neural networks will mostly classify this also as face okay okay so for i mean this was a problem that was found in neural networks of course nowadays neural networks will be able to classify this as not a face but uh now uh, but this was actually a problem uh, which was found out in neural networks that they are very good at understanding okay this is a i all those things and they they can say okay whenever i find a i i will say that this is a face but the orientation of the two things sometimes because this particular way of uh, i mean the large stride of i mean a, a filter which has look which is looking at both the eyes simultaneously more in most cases in neural networks won't be able to learn the learn those things and therefore it misses orientation in certain cases so because of that another class of neural networks were invented in some 20 13 or 14 i think not 13 14 16 17 
so those are known as capsule networks but uh, yeah so don't we don't we are not going in going in there okay. Yeah, so that is that is about why you are learning neural networks. The other thing is, um, uh, okay. So what was the other thing about? Uh, yeah, max pool and average pool. Okay, so max pool. So what is max pool about? Let's say again you are classifying faces. Okay, and you have. Um, so, you have some uh, kernels and all those things you have done and towards the end what you have done what you what you have seen here is ok. So, ok. So, consider the kernels as neurons ok right now. So, these are some kernels in one one in the stage of your classification and this is another kernel in the next stage of your classification ok. This kernel is very good at predicting at finding out eyes. You have trained your neural network, it has become very good at predicting uh, whether your uh, um, uh, wh whether the uh, whether the image has eyes or not. This has become very predict uh, this has become very um, uh, good at predicting whether there is a hut or not and uh, this has become very predictive at uh, whether and the color black is present or not let us say ok. Some 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 something has been learned you are you do not have any such you you, you do not know what it has learned but uh, however internally some, somebody tells you that ok these are the three things that these three kernels have learned and now you want to go on to the next stage. Now if your input let us say if your input was actually a face. if your input was actually a face this would have a very high value because it will find eyes and it will say that ok I am I am very confident that whatever thing I was looking for is actually present in this image. This will give you a very low value and this again will give a medium value because hair might be there which it might be black therefore this is a medium value let us say. Now if you are to classify your if you are to classify your uh, new if you are to classify your face as eyes then the information that should flow on to the next level should be this should be the highest possible value that you had am i correct i mean is this making sense yes sir so that is why you take a maximum of different values of the new of different kernels and you populate this particular input based on these or the maximum of the input values ok. So, uh, let us say you will have something of this something like this. So, you take uh, so what you will do is you will take a max pool and you will do it over a 2 cross 2 block. So, whatever this 2 cross 2 the maximum value will be put here the maximum value of this 2 cross 2 block will be put here the maximum value of this 2 cross 2 block will be put here and that will be put here ok. So, that first of all it reduces the dimension of your uh, dimension of your image uh, I mean dimension of your features and also it takes the most relevant features I mean uh, the most relevant features which might be more most important for your classification it takes them it takes them it suppresses the others and moves ahead in your learning ok. So, that is max pool max pool is the one that is most widely used average pool is generally not used for I mean average pool will generally not have such a effect it will just uh, I mean it will say that ok if some if in this four neurons something is present I, I want to move it here I mean it will take an average of these four and put a value here. So, that will reduce the dimension of your features and also if anything is present it will pass that information out. And what, what is flattening sir? Flat Flattening. Yeah, so flattening is what will happen is I mean uh, if you if you if you understand the way neural I mean these convolutional neural networks are working, so it will always give you matrices, right? Correct. Hello. Yes, sir. Yeah, it will always give it. It will continue giving you matrices towards the end, but again, as I said, 
at the end whatever you are doing with neural networks at the end you will just have a logistic regression layer. So, for logistic regression layer it cannot take a matrix it will always take a vector it will always take a vector because you would you would do w transpose x plus b for classification right and you will put a sigmoid on top of it. So, in order to get a vector from a matrix you would use the flattening layer. So, it is like if you have a matrix like 2 2 4 4 after 2 2 4 4 after flattening it will become 2 2 4 4 and this becomes your input to your logistic regression layer. So, once you get that pooling output, so that output before we give it to classifier, we yeah. flatten that. We flatten that into a vector and pass it through the logistic regression. Okay, okay. Got it, sir, sir now yeah. tell what is that uh, word uh, convolutional meaning, sir? Yeah, so this particular way of, uh, I mean, you, you were putting those filters and moving it around and multiplying and getting a value, right? Yes, that, sir. That operation is known as convolution. In, okay. in, CNN, in CNN networks, that is the meaning of convolution. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Okay. Sir. Yeah. I have one last question. Yeah. Instead of having 3 cross 3, hmm. suppose if we take uh, 5 cross 5. Right. Uh, what will happen this computation time and everything varies? Uh, yeah, everything yeah. will vary. Everything will vary. Okay. So, instead of uh, taking higher version, we have to start from lower version like that we are doing? Or uh, yeah, generally, I mean generally if you do a 5 cross 5 thing in the beginning itself, hmm. then uh, that will um so see one more th okay i won't go into that anyway yeah so if you have a 3 cross 3 layer in the beginning then that means that you are looking at very small features of small portions of the very local portions of the image okay and trying to get features out of them if you uh, so uh, so the way neural networks learn the best is if you have very local features at the bottom and slowly you learn higher level features for example, your local features would be very local features would be an, a vertical edge, uh, 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 then a, a, a horizontal edge and so on. Yes. Higher up you would you would see more more things like okay, uh, it will take the shape of eyes whether eyes are present or not. So, you might have missed some sort of features. So, in that case. Uh Ha, so, uh, ha, so uh, finally at the end of the day nothing is in your hands. <laughs> so, uh, everything it will be learned by the convolutional neural network itself, but you will have to give it the opportunity to learn. If you start with a stride of let us say, I mean if you have uh, uh, an image of 32 cross 32 and you put in a stride of 10, that means that you most, most, most likely you are not giving the neural network any chance to learn. Because it is, amount of shift is very, high. very high, it is not looking at correlated features. Okay. 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 Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Sir, and back propagation. Yeah. Um, so, if depends on like a back propagation can lead to local optima or global optima, right, sir? So, does it depend huh. upon um, like what parameters it depends? It again, it depends upon that uh, number of hidden layers or. Uh, uh, units in that layer or activation function like uh, what, what yeah so uh, so see the uh, so we were not worrying about all these local minima and uh, and global minima and all those things before i mean in logistic regression we were not worrying about this in linear regression also we were not worrying about this but now we are worrying about this why see back propagation is just an algorithm okay it was taught in detail in the in the in the class that is why I am not going through it, but if your loss function is something like this then it is highly likely I mean it is you, you should be very bad at choosing your learning rate if you are to miss this particular point. You will always go to this particular point. Now, you start adding nonlinearities. So, this function is I mean these are a group of well defined functions which are known as just a minute. Which are why is this just give me a minute?
yeah what happened okay so these are a group of functions which are known as convex functions okay so convex functions are very good you will always go to the global optima global minima and everything is fine however whenever you add these neural networks and with all those nonlinearities in between what happens is your loss this is your loss basically your loss ceases to remain convex so it becomes like this or even more complicated so in this case you will have multiple optima multiple local minima and this is the reason why it will uh, it will go on to the it ca it can get stuck in one of these local minima now coming to your question there can be multiple reasons one thing of course would be if you increase the number of hidden neurons or the number of hidden layers then your loss curve becomes more and more complicated the non linearities are the actual culprits behind making the loss curves more complicated okay uh, but at the same time you have seen that if you are not using non linearity then you will basically not learn anything meaningful so the non linearities are required at the same time they will make your loss curves like this so non linearities are the reason why you will get stuck in local minima in neural networks Okay. Any more doubts? Yeah. Regarding perceptron, sir. Huh. So, um, in the notes, huh. um, ma'am's notes, we had something like uh, perceptrons can have linear separate uh, separable huh, huh. boundary. Yes, yes. So, if each perceptron can have a linear separable boundary, hmm. how can multiple perceptrons put together create a non-linearity in AMM? Multiple. Yeah, so if you stack some nonlinearities, okay. So because what I means my what I when I read that point, hmm. uh, I was what I was thinking was if each perceptron is hmm. like each unit is only creating linearity, and if I kind of give that linear to another linear, so it it's always linear. No, right? like you are you are forgetting one thing. In neural networks, you have the you have this is a let's say a perceptron, right? This is a perceptron, correct? Yes. You pass it through some nonlinearity, right? Uh, means activation function, right? Some activation function. Right. Some activation function. Then you pass it to another perceptron. So, sir, perceptron is only sigmoid. Then it's not, it doesn't include activation function. No, perceptron. I felt. Huh. Perceptron, percept the, the perceptron learning algorithm would finally have a thresholding function. Okay, it will have a thresholding function towards the end. But if you are thinking of neural networks as groups of perceptron, then I would suggest that okay, then look at them as individual neurons is only the perceptron followed by an activation function. If you didn't have this, if you didn't have this activation function, then what you are saying is correct. Then it would it would have been perfectly linear. You are passing a linear thing, linear output to a linear in, to a model which is also linear. Then it will of course be linear. But you are okay. So, hmm. so yeah. perceptron is not a combination of sigmoid function and activation function. No, because uh, perceptron is like uh, you will. I mean, in neural networks, what you are doing is you are doing some W transpose X plus B. Then you are putting some activation function on top of it. Okay, right. so this part you can think of as a perceptron. This part you can think of separately as an activation function. Okay. Okay. okay because this concept of activation function is not there in perceptrons. Okay, sir. Got it. Yeah. And why do perceptrons? They say perceptrons have mono monotonicity property. Ha. Huh, so that proof was not there in the class, I believe. Yeah, right. but that statement was there. Ha, right. that statement was there. So, uh, so actually, the perceptron learning algorithm was also not there, if I am correct. No, learning algorithm was not there, sir. But uh, the, the, the explanation of what perceptron was was given. Right. So basically, what happens is, uh, so perceptrons have a very uh, very simple learning rule. So suppose you have w one, w two, up to dot dot w n as your weights okay and you have the 
features as x1 up to xn I mean this is for a particular example this is for a particular example okay uh, so you have n dimensional features and you have n dimensional weights then uh, your uh, so uh, so what you finally so uh, let me write this as w let me write this as x so finally what you will do is you will take w transpose x and so then the thresholding function will come into picture if this is greater than equal to 0 then this is class 1 if it is less than 0 then it is class 0 this is the perceptron inference algorithm correct yes sir now the uh, the learning algorithm of perceptron is something like so suppose you have a positive example positive means class 1 a positive or a class 1 example and uh, you denote uh, you the, den the features you have denoted by xp then you have if you have w transpose xp less than 0 is this clear this means that your perceptron uh, the current w weights they have actually misclassified your example is this clear right yes sir in that case what you will do is you will simply do w equal to w plus xp similarly if you have w transpose xn xn is a negative example if it is greater than equal to 0 then you will do w equal to w minus xn this is your perceptron learning algorithm and using so where the do, where does this happen sir plus xp or minus xn is it like while back propagation learning waves no no perceptron is not uh, back propagation perceptron is simply this you take weights you take example one by one of your training example you take one by one all the examples you take whenever you find a positive example where this condition holds true where it is misclassified you do this whenever basically you weight correct huh uh, basically weight correction yes so whenever you have a negative weights whenever you see that your negative uh, class is actually assigned to a positive class you do this and you do this for sufficient number of times finally what you will see is your w won't change that much or everything is classified perfectly so then you can say that your uh, perceptron algorithm has converged has converged yeah now uh, based on these learning uh, algorithm only uh, you can say that perceptron will always converge if the problem is linearly separable but of course this learning algorithm itself was not there so i am not going into the proof of that this is simply neural network right sir huh so this you can think of each of the neurons as some uh, as some uh, as a perceptron yeah as some perceptron but neural networks are basically multi layer perceptrons with non linearities in between so let's say if you have if you have uh, a perceptron so perceptron is something like this right so if you have x you have b you do a w transpose x plus b then you have a thresholding function so this is the representation of a perceptron but i would suggest that uh, see uh, here what is happening is here the nonlinearity is always uh, a thresholding function but in neural networks a nonlinearity is never a thresholding function it is relu it is sigmoid it is stanage whatever but it is never a thresholding function so therefore what happens is uh, you can think of if you are thinking of perceptrons then you shouldn't you shouldn't think of the thresholding function also because thresholding functions are not used in in neural networks you should think of it as small neurons followed by some nonlinear activations so what is that monotonicity property sir then yeah so the monotonicity property of perceptrons would be if you i mean you can show that if you follow this learning rule if you if you follow this learning rule then uh, monotonicity property is like at every point of at every point of time you will move closer and closer to your optimal w star okay 
So, and with sufficient number of steps, you will actually converge to W star. That can be proved. So, uh, one other question regarding deep networks, sir. Yeah. So, the, in, again in this uh, notes only, it was mentioned, deep networks tend to have more local minima problems than mm -hmm. shallow networks yes. during supervised training. So, yes. that is what you meant, right, sir, like more linear or non-linearity. Yes, 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 yes. Oh, the okay. more non-linearity you will introduce, you will learn more, but at the same time, you will have more local minima in your loss curve. So, in that case, we have to do some trade off between how much of depth we want yes, to go. Yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. Okay. And what is, um, we have this epochs, right, sir, where we kind hmm. of uh, hmm. go. Hmm. So, uh, like, what is the difference between, like, is epoch, is it related to stochastic gradient descent or it is brand? No, brand stochastic, brand? stochastic gradient descent is when you take, um, I mean, so, you update your weights, right? In neural networks, you will update your weights something like this W t minus 1 minus alpha times something, uh, some dou e by dou w, right? You will do something like this. So, uh, so this evaluated at t minus 1. So, if you take the, I mean the loss here, the loss that you see, the error that you see, if you compute that error for one example at a time, then that is stochastic gradient descent. Got my point? Okay. You take okay. you take one example, you find out the error, you update your weight. Again, you take one example, you update your weight. Okay. Badge gradient descent is you say you take 32 examples in one go, let us say mini match gradient descent. So, there is okay, there is something known as batch gradient descent. So, batch is you take the entire all the training samples that you had, you take all of them, you can compute the error and you, then you uh, update your weight at the end of it. Okay? So, that is the exact opposite of stochastic gradient descent. But uh, now there are two things. First thing is batch gradient descent cannot be done because of computational purposes. You will have 10,000 examples, you cannot load 10,000 examples in one go into your CPU it will crash. The other example is stochastic gradient descent that is very good computationally because you will take only one example and, and uh, all those things would be fine. But then what happen is what will happen is suppose the one example that you took in one particular go that is an outlier that is a noisy sample let us say right it might happen there might be a noisy sample uh, in your training data so it might happen. So, when you take the noisy sample and you update your weight there, that means you are updating your weight based on a noisy sample only. So, that becomes a very noisy estimate of your, uh, that becomes a very noisy version of gradient descent. Okay? So, the best thing what people do is a mini batch gradient descent. What mini batch will mean? You will take 32 examples, you will compute the error for those 32 examples, you will update the weight. Again, you will take another 32 examples from your training data, you will compute the error, you will update the weight and so on. So, that is known as mini wedge gradient descent. And so, let us say you have 1000 examples and your batch size mini batch size is 10, let us say. So, that means after 100 such weight updates, you have actually looked at your entire training data. That is known as one epoch. Is it can, can you repeat sir once that last Suppose sentence. your training data is 1000 samples, you have a batch size of 10. So, how many batches do we have to train your model on? 100. So, after 100 that means you have gone through your entire training data, right? right. That is known as one epoch. Again from the next epoch, you will again start tra training your data in batches. Again, you will take 10, 100 different batches and you will train your data that will be known as, the, as your second epoch and so on. Epoch okay, okay. and epoch is called only when you have looked at your entire training data. Okay, got it. Sir. Yeah. Okay. 
okay so any more questions I have one last question sir yeah again from our notes only so um, yeah from the page 34 sir like um, the representation capability of neural networks hmm. there are a couple of points sir like every bounded continuous function can be approximated ah, with you don't need to go into so that you go into do, you don't need to go into that okay so that is understand that point ha, 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 that i don't think would be required that is there is something known as universal approximation theorem so that says that um, uh, if i mean uh, that says that uh, if you have more than a two layer neural network you can approximate any function in the world there exists a neural network with which you can approximate any function in the world however that function you may may find it may not find it by means of learning okay so yeah so that is that is our that is far far out of the scope of this course so you don't need to okay. look into that yeah okay sir okay so i guess that would be all uh, so next week again we'll meet at this same time 6 o'clock and uh, yeah thank you for joining today i hope it was helpful thank you sir thank you thank you sir uh, it was it was really very helpful thank you so much thank you bye i'll close the call